All right, here we go. We have Georgia royalty in the building. Pastor Troy, welcome to Vlad TV. Hey, man, I'm excited to be here, man. What's going on? Long time coming. Yeah, long time coming. Uh, I've been a fan forever. That's uh, good. No play in GA is like a, a timeless anthem. Yeah, man. Glad it's my song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's your first time here. Yeah. I'm going to start in the very beginning. Uh-huh. All right. So you grew up in Georgia. Yep, yep. Uh, College Park? College Park, Georgia. Yeah, man. Kind of by the airport. Okay. And I guess your father was originally a drill instructor who yeah. became a pastor? Yeah, 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 man. You know what I mean? Grew up real military, real strict, you know, mili- real discipline. I ain't going to say strict. I say discipline. You know what I mean? And uh, later on in his life, man, probably when I was 12 or 13, he became a pastor. So it was kind of like uh, we stopped being like, listening to rap music and stuff in the house. And we all loved it so much at the time, man. You know what I mean? It was very difficult. It was a very difficult time, man. a very difficult time. But rap was becoming the new force in music. You know what I mean? It was just really hard to get away from. You know what I mean? But I understood where my father was coming from, you know, being 12 and 13 years old, listening to NWA Fuck the Police and stuff like that, man. You know, you got to have your head ready for that kind of music and stuff like that. So I understood what he was trying to keep us from because, hell, here I am as a father still trying to keep my 15, 16-year-olds from listening to the wrong stuff. You know what I mean? So it ended up working all the way out, man. When I became uh, 18, 19, I went off to college in Augusta, Georgia, man, and I started rapping. And I turned to Pastor Troy. Okay, and I want to get to all that. Good. I just want to you know tell your whole story leading up to it. So... For sure. Your dad is a pa- your dad is a pastor at this point, uh-huh. and your parents are still together. Yep, yep, yep. Forty nine years. W- beautiful. Yeah, beautiful thing. Okay, and how many kids in the family? Man, it's five of us. Man, five of us. Three boys and two girls. I'm the uh, second to the oldest. Man, so my big brother is five years older than me. Al, he was the one that brought the rap. Man, I remember it like it was yesterday. He just came home like, man, we ain't listening to Michael Jackson no more. He gay. We like what? We break dancers now, you know, we hip hop, we B-boys now. I'm like, all right, run it. And that was the beginning of falling in love with it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember we're similar ages. I'm a few years older. Uh-huh. But, I mean, when hip hop came around and break dancing and everything, you just fell in love with it. Yeah. It was just hit, one of those things. So yeah. Man, I'm telling you, man, Beat Street, man, I give them so much credit because seeing that movie and seeing them making money from graffiti and break dance and all this stuff, I'm like, this is a movie? Oh, my God. I don't know if anybody watched Beat Street, how I watched it, man, but it meant so much to me. Oh, yeah. I love Beat Street. And th- the funny part is when I interviewed uh, Melly Mel, he yeah. said he didn't like the movie, and he was in it. For real, but, man. That's, the, that's what we loved about it, man. Beat Street right, right. now. Uh, <laughs> man, I had a chance. 8 Ball and MJG stopped by my studio down here in Atlanta one day, man, and, and it had just came on. Man, we sat there and watched the whole movie, man. It just had us a good time with it. I said, man, I guess the rappers saw something different when we watched it, man. We saw careers. Some people saw a movie. We saw a career. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you're growing up in this in this family. Uh-huh. Mom and dad still together. You got four, uh, four other siblings. Yeah. And is the family okay financially or are they kind of struggling? Uh, we cool, you know. Middle class family, you know, middle class family. My dad working, taking care of the house and everything. It's cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you end up going to Creekside High School. Yep. Creekside. Creekside High. Right. You graduate and Uh, you go to college. Yep. I went to college down in Augusta, Georgia, man. It was about two and a half hours away from Atlanta. You know, it was cool being away from home for the first time and everything, but Best believe I took advantage of the situation. <laughs> you feel what I mean? Being out on my own and stuff like that, man, not having my parents to have their eyes over me like that, man. It was real cool. I, I One of the things that I really think about is uh, the lyrics to Vice Versa, one of my joints. You know, I wrote it while I was down there in college. And just seeing what was going on in school and the stuff that I had learned growing up, and just seeing that a lot of the stuff that everybody thought was good, I thought was bad. And a lot of stuff that everybody thought was bad, I thought was really good. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it was just dope, man, to have that kind of uh, knowledge instilled in me already to get out there and have to face the real world. You know what I mean? 
Okay, and you started rapping while you were in college? I had already been rapping in high school and stuff like that, man, but it wasn't nothing I was taking serious because, hell, I couldn't listen to rap music at home. You know what I mean? But after I got to college and started doing it, man, people started hearing me. They were like, they didn't know me from Atlanta. They just knew me from Augusta, and they just started respecting me as a rapper. And I just stayed down with it. Okay, so you graduated, what, like 95 from high school? 96. 96. Yeah. Okay. And it wasn't until 99 when you released your first album. So those three years, were you kind of honing your craft and, yeah. and trying to figure out your lane? Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So with being from Augusta, they didn't really have a music scene down there, but they were all in it and trying to get into it. They didn't have what I had seen here in Atlanta with the Dungeon Family and Raheem the Dream and uh, Goody Mob and stuff like that. This was stuff that I was seeing as a high school senior on into a freshman and stuff like that, man. It was really Atlanta really just getting on the map. So being from there, starting my career in Augusta, it was already like they already were respecting me from the stuff that Outkast and, uh, you know, Goody Mob was doing. So it was really like a boost for me, man. It was just a beautiful thing for me to come out of Augusta. Okay. And by the time uh, We Ready comes out, like yeah. that was actually your first song that you recorded? Yeah, man. That was the first time I went to the studio, man, to a real professional studio and, and got down. You know what, man? It actually came out in September of 1998. The masses just heard it at 99, you know, like spring 99. But we had already been partying into it all across the Southeast. Okay. And by the time you're, you're getting ready, you know, to really put out this music and so forth. Yeah. What was your lifestyle like? Because, you know, very much, you know, gangster type lyrics, a yeah. rough kind of lifestyle, you know, but yeah. you come from a certain, you know, a stable home. Yeah. So be between those years, did you end up getting into the streets or were you still kind of in the straight and narrow? I was out there, man. I was out there and it was more so like I was reporting. One thing about preacher kids, we're not the best. <laughs> you know what I mean, man? And uh, of course, I learned my way to maneuver in the streets, but still be able to come home and keep everything clean. So it wasn't like I was blind to it or wasn't hip to it. You know what I mean? I was way more hip. So just with uh, going to college and everything, being down in Augusta, being on my own and stuff like that, hanging out with the guys that were hustling and stuff like that, it wasn't nothing new to me. You know what I mean? So it was actually me just talking about, rapping about the stuff that I was experiencing that I already knew about and the thing that I was learning at the time. Okay. And... So, so this song, uh, No More Play in GA. Yeah. Um, it starts off with a, a phone call. Yeah. Yeah. Was that an actual phone call or did you guys just redo it? Yeah, yeah. We just did it in the studio, man, having fun. But the craziest part about it, man, every time I think back on it, man, that time we wrapping up the album, we're done with it. Man, we didn't have any fans besides the four or five people that knew we was in the studio that day. For that song to take off and do what it did, I never would have imagined that just that little phone call would take that song and do it like it did. Right, because it starts off, you know, there's a phone call and there's a guy, you know, answers the phone, No Limit Studios. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, yeah, can I speak to P? He's like, yeah. P ain't here. Yeah. And then you say, and then you say. And tell them Pastor Troy and them down South Georgia boys said, we, since everybody think they soldiers, what's up, we'll go to war. Hung the phone okay. up and the music came in. You know, the music comes in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's dope, man. You know what I mean? And that's still my stance. It wasn't nothing like, hey, Master P, hey, I want to kill you or anything like that. But it was just putting everybody on alert that we we coming. Right. And you at that point have never even met Master P. There was no I, actual beef. I still or, haven't. Or, I still <laughs> haven't. Okay. You still haven't met all nope. these years later. Yeah. So, and from what I understand, like you basically starting this beef with Master P was just something to do. It yeah. wasn't really based on any specific activity or, uh -uh. or words or It really or wasn't, nothing. man. It really wasn't, man. It was more so the guys in the studio with me like, man, we going at P. I'm like, man, I don't care. I'm really more concerned about getting this stuff finished and out there, but I appreciate the marketing from my boys and stuff like that, man. They were like, man, this joint is set it off. We're like, all right, cool. But like I say, still, it wasn't nothing like, hey, man, we, when we see him, we going to kill him, we going to shoot him. That wasn't nothing like that, man. We were coming from, from some... Hey, we them down south Georgia boys. I'm Pastor Troy. Everybody think they soldiers. What's up? Let's go to war. This us. And we stand on it. Okay. So 
that song comes out. Mm -hmm. Does it start to do something right away or does it take a while? It started out instantly. It spread like wildfire, man. It spread like wildfire. Everybody was uh everybody was kind of not, not I'm not gonna say over the masterpiece stuff, but people could respect the fact that, hey, this is somebody from Georgia. You know what I mean, man? At the time, Georgia, we probably was the number one no limit state, you know what I mean, with the music and stuff like that, man. So just to have somebody from the hometown making the same kind of style of music, representing, talking about stuff from here, it just made everybody have a real allegiance to it, man. And uh, everybody was excited. Everybody was pushing past Detroit and the down south Georgia boys. Everybody wanted their friends to hear it. You know what I mean? And uh, it worked. I mean, how did it feel to go from recording the studio, you know, in the studio, being essentially unknown as a rapper at that point? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like yeah. you had built up this huge following over all these years. Not like you yeah. go to the studio, you do your first song, and suddenly the song starts to, to take off, and now you're actually in the game. Yeah. Man, it's dope, man. You know what I mean? The independent game, man, I love it, and I take so much pride in it for coming in the way that I did, man. You know what I mean? I had my stints with the majors, but I still never had that goal or platinum status, man. I've always had that real independent drive, man. 300, 400,000, that was pretty cool, you know, doing it with the majors. But my whole time I'm there, I'm, I'm saying, damn, what if that was me with Selecto hits, man, doing this for seven or $8 a piece? So everything I learned with the majors, it was cool. I took it all in stride, but I couldn't wait to get back to being independent and handling the business that I know I can handle, man. Like, when we start, first started selling that CD, man, we ordered up with disc makers, got the first CDs back, man. We probably ordered 1,000 CDs. Man, we sold those 1,000 CDs in probably a weekend. People flagging us down, $20 a pop, just buying the CD, buying the CD. All right, now we got all these CDs gone. We made five, six grand, besides the joints that we passed out and putting our money back to press them up. We're like, man... More people need to get it. More people need to get it. So we hooked up with the record store down there. So our next order, the record store came in, and we started selling them by the boxes, the box of 100 for $8 a piece. Man, it, it was it was lines of people coming to get these CDs, man. You had to buy 100 Boom, 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 boom. It's just a beautiful thing, man. A lot of people talk about what they did with the independent game in Atlanta, but if you know anything about what really happened, I was the first one that did that, man. I dropped a bunch of crumbs that I don't get credit for. You know what I mean? But them ducks just picked them up, kept eating them, and kept walking. Well, you dropped the song. Yeah. And it's a, it's a disc record, a Master P and No Limit, obviously. Uh-huh. And well, you haven't actually run into any of these guys, so mm -hmm. this is all just on wax and, and so forth. Yeah. Until there was a concert in Nashville. Yeah. A concert in Nashville, man. It was called, like... Uh, Impact or something like that. I think that was the name of the conference, Impact. It's kind of like Jack the Rapper or something like that. There's the stuff that I know now, but I didn't know then. And I was with uh, Alan Henderson, a former uh, Atlanta Hawks player. They had put out an album, Pastor Troy and the Congregation, with Hindu, uh, Hindu Records. So they invite me to the event. They're like, Troy, we want you to come to this music conference. Uh, we got you like 10 grand to come up here for Saturday and Sunday. I'm like, cool. Me and my dog, Lil Pete, I wasn't with the Down South Georgia boys. It was us going with the professional basketball player. We get out to this to this event, and it's the biggest thing that I have ever seen in the game. You know what I mean? I didn't know anything about these kind of music conferences. You know what I mean? So we're there, man. I'm seeing Missy Elliott. I'm seeing Busta Rhymes. I'm seeing all these real celebrities at the time. And we're performing at the club that night. Everybody knows that Pastor Troy is going to be at this show or whatever, but I'm performing with the Hindu and the congregation or whatever. We get to that venue that night, man. We know the security at the door. I got my dog, Lil Pete, with me, man. Lil Pete got a pistol with him. Get to the door, security pat us down. We know this dude. He like our neighbor. He like, oh, no, man, we can't have the guns in here, man. We can't do that tonight. All right, cool. Take the gun back to the car. We like, hey, yo, man, don't let nobody else in here with no guns either. Oh, ain't nobody coming through my door with no gun. Hell no. All right, cool. So we upstairs. We upstairs. It's finally about showtime. Everybody in the building. When they go to the stage, the congregation is performing first. I'm just kind of on stage 
chilling, shaking hands and stuff like that. Man, uh, in the middle of they set, I just see the crowd just start getting kind of antsy and everything, man. I'm turned one way. Man, when I turn back around, No Limit got the whole stage surrounded. I'm like, oh, shit. All I'm thinking about is really, man, they got their hands in their hoodies, man. I'm like, I know that dude at the door just, he, it's like, I mean, I just felt set up, man. We were, we were stuck. Luckily, the dude uh, from the congregation see them and he break out. When he break out, I didn't, it was so early in the game for me, man. I ain't have posters. I ain't have flyers. People didn't know what I looked like or anything. And they gave chase to one of the congregation members. And I was able to go the other way and escape the situation. Uh, you know, I always think, I think back on that night, you know what I mean? And so thankful for it happening the way it did because it prepared me for the next 23 years. You know what I mean? I haven't been touched and I haven't had any problems on the road. We know how to handle it and we know how to maneuver. You know what I mean? So I'm thankful. Thankful that I'm thankful that everything went the way it went. You know what I mean? As embarrassing as it was at the time, it would have been even more embarrassing to kill somebody, man, and end my career 20 years, <laughs> you know, before it started. You know what I mean, man? So we took that all in stride, man. It was a learning lesson. And we just got back out here and really started turning it up. You know what I mean, man? And here we are. Right, and you and C Murder actually ended up talking years later. Yeah, 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 man. You know what I mean? I reached out to C, you know, since he's been gone on his bid, man. You know what I mean? But just look at that situation, man. Look at the karma. You know what I mean? Look at the energy. You know what I mean? This was right after that. He's probably been gone for 20 years now. You know what I mean, man? That, I wish the best for him, man. I wish him home, but I'm just so thankful that I ain't played myself off the streets. Well, at the time the song was popping, yeah, I guess I guess that you were offered to headline uh, ATL's birthday bash. Yeah, man, the birthday bash, man. You know that's the biggest concert, man, that we have down here, man. You know I always tell people, man, those are my little baby days when they were offering me to uh, headline the birthday bash and Master P. Uh, you know the radio station be kind of slow, kind of behind what's really going on in the streets, and Master P went to the radio station and had me removed off the show and. He was placed on the show, and it just wasn't it just wasn't a good 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 move down here in Atlanta, man, because everybody had already flipped. Everybody was so Pastor Troy, down South Georgia boy, representing for the home team. He had a very difficult concert that night. And then, man, luckily, my boys, the Goody Mob, hearing about what was going on and everything, man, I was already on a commercial when my voiceover switched out to his. So the Goody Mob was like, hey, yo, man, they gave me a call. They're like, Pastor Troy, man. We want you to perform on our set, man. Can't nobody take you off no show. So, man, they invited me over to the dungeon before the concert, man. While we pulling up to the concert, man, we probably about two miles away. We could hear the crowd screaming, we ready from the car, man. You know what I mean? I was like, oh, my God, we about to go crazy in here. Dog, man, Goody Mob gets on the stage, and they stop. They said, man, to bring me out, I could just hear CeeLo saying, man, you know, ATL, one thing about us, man, we stick together. With that being said, come on, Troy. When No More Player G8 came on at that damn Lakewood Amphitheater, I was viral before viral. You feel me, man? That thing was crazy. I wish we had some footage anywhere. If anybody see this joint, man, and you have footage of that tape, please make it known, man, because that was something to see, man. It really changed Atlanta forever, man. I started carrying a championship building and everything. <laughs> <laughs> right, and you ended up going on on the Rough Riders tour at some yeah, point. Yeah, man. Yeah, beautiful thing, man. Dog, they let me uh open up, man. I was opening up dates on the Rough Rider Cash Money tour, man. You know, and I I remember Greenville, North, South, Greenville, North Carolina. I never forget DMX coming out, Birdman coming out, Lil Wayne, all these people coming out from backstage to see what the hell was going on when I was performing No More Playing GA. Man, it was going down. You know, man, my show is my show's tough, man. I got a I got a nice ass show still to this day. We got some songs that you can't get away from. So you go ahead and drop the I am DSGB album. Yeah. Um, and then Ludacris drops his debut album. Uh-huh. And he asked you to be on it. Yeah, yeah. Man, you know, I man, I was running, man, I had ATL soul on lock at that time. It was hard to 
it was almost like we gotta have Pastor Troy on here for the for the crib. You feel me, man? They really wasn't they wasn't set up just yet, man. I was already going to Alabama's and South Carolinas and Florida building this thing up, man. So my voice and my sound and the voila, huh? I was on everybody's joint. And you know, and it was cool because I was really out there by myself. You know what I mean? I needed some more allies and stuff like that. I just didn't expect them to goddamn disappear after they got into position. <laughs> I mean, being on Ludacris' first album, uh, yeah. Back for the First Time, you were on the song Get Off Me. Uh -huh. Did you have any idea how big Ludacris was going to get later on? You know what? Um, I really wasn't tripping about that. I just knew that he was at the radio station and he stood a good chance. You feel me, man? So my stance was always the same. I always wanted everybody to go. I was already there. But we needed more, you know what I mean? We needed more. So that was my. That's why I was so. That's why it was so easy for somebody to call me and say, "Hey, Troy, I want you on my album. Cool, yeah. We need somebody else, you know, from Tip to Jeezy, everybody, man. I'm on everybody's first joint because yeah. we needed more people. You know what I mean? Right. That same year, you also dropped the the Pastor Troy for President album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and, that was like that was mixtape, and then that was making Universal and stuff move. They didn't understand what I was doing, but it was so needed at the time. You know what I mean? The negotiations and stuff, when you start dealing with majors and the times that it take with that, man, you'll lose your whole buzz dealing with that shit. You feel me, man? So I took it in my own hands and just started dropping products independently, man, selling them out the trunk. I knew what to do. I knew how to press everything up. So when that went down, man, Universal was finally like, okay, we cool. Let's stop pressing up all that shit and we're going to do a deal. Okay, and they did a deal with you, and that was for the Face Off yep, album? Face -off, for the, for yeah, For that next one? Yep, yep, for the Face Off album. For the Face Off album. Okay, and I mean, even the name Face Off yeah. is kind, kind of a play off your name, right? Yeah, yeah. Man, with the Castro Troy movie from the, uh, from the Face Off movie with uh, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage, that was about the same year, same time. And when they came out with his name, and it was Castro Troy, I almost lost my mind. I loved it. You know what I mean? He was kind of uh, sinister, man. He had his collar, church collar on and everything, man. I was like, man, Pastor Troy. I was already Pastor Troy. Then they came with this dude, Pastor Troy. I was just like, Face Off would be perfect for this first album. And we dropped. And you dropped it, and it actually debuted 83 on the Billboard charts. That's dope. That's dope. That's dope. Yep. And you know, man, and I'm still was an independent, a real true independent, man. I didn't get the... Nelly love at Universal. I didn't get the cash money, Juvie Lil Wayne treatment. I was still just this little dude from Atlanta. Uh, we'll take it. We'll see if it hangs around, if this sound even lasts. But they really didn't know what to do with it, man. Had they really known, we definitely would have did platinum and gold. Man, come on, man. These songs are a part of these people. Life so hard. I was also a part of the bootleg age as well. So, hell, a good... A good 300,000 soul is definitely a half a million from the book, from the bootleg world. What'd you say? Yeah. And uh, vice versa. Yeah. On that album. Yeah, yeah. Which ended up being one of your biggest songs. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Dope, man. You know, with the whole thing, with the Face Off album, we brought, we went back, we put out the original album for the world to hear. And we added about five or six joints. And that vice versa was one that we added. And it just took it to a whole nother place. Well, that same year, uh, T.I. comes out with his debut album, uh -huh. I'm Serious. Yeah. And you're on that album as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on that, man. You know, we have been controlling the streets, man. That whole crunk sound, the whole energy, man. I, my voice is made for that. You know what I mean? My voice is made for that. You know what I mean? DSGB hit so hard and had gotten so strong in the Southeast, they had to holler at me to be on those songs, to get those blessings, to go to them other states, man. I remember going to different states and people asking me about, uh, how does this T.I. do? Or how does this do? You know what I mean? Coming out of Atlanta. I'm always like, hey, man, they cool. Check them out. It's going to be straight. You know what I mean? And everybody did what they were supposed to do with what was set up to do it from. You feel me? Well, yeah, you showed up on the I'm Serious remix. yeah. And and that was really before T.I. really popped. Like, that first album, you know, you didn't yeah. get the real T.I. back then. He he really, I think, popped off on a second album. Yeah, he had to figure it out, man. You know what I mean? And I'm proud yeah. of him for doing it. You know what I mean? But my consistency, I was always, I've always been Pastor Troy. 
You know what I mean, man? No features, no nothing. Troy, you know what I mean, man? A lot of people had to go back to the drawing board and really figure out what the hell is he doing over there? And when they got it all together, man, everybody. Whew. Well, that next year, 2002, uh, you dropped the, the Hell to Pay album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was another time I was in a standstill with Universal. They had started signing everybody that sounded like, they had just started signing, signing everybody out the South that sounded remotely close to Pastor Troy. They just signed everything up. So here I go. I got a damn fight off a miracle, fight off a drama. I had to goddamn do all this work to still keep Pastor Troy. Hell, Archie's coming with my same title as my record, We Ready. I got to get through that, man. I had so much damn work to do, man. The build is well deserved. <laughs> you know what I mean? The build is well deserved. Okay, and then that same year, uh, you showed up on Lil John's album, yeah, on um, Throw Throw It Up, yeah, which ended up being your biggest song ever. I mean, yeah. that you were on, period. Yeah. yeah, 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 man. That was a big record, man. That was a big record. Lil John had produced on my album, and that was my swap back the uh, the Throw It Up record, man. You know, it was huge, but it may have been too big for its own good, man, because we didn't shoot a video for that joint. You know what I mean? It was a uh, why. It was just at a difficult time, man. You know what I mean? I, I, it would have been too pivotal for me. You feel me? It would have been too big for me and not big enough for John. You feel me? So they kind of went another direction. It's cool, but when your album introduction is one, that second song is probably one of your singles. And Throw It Up is definitely number two. But that's the stuff that I had to shake off and live and learn with, man. Hell, I wrote that verse for a video and had to accept mm. it we didn't shoot it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's cool, man. My road been different. Yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a song. <laughs> For sure. I mean, to to this day. <laughs> to I mean, this you day, get, it tear a room up, yeah, man. To this yeah. day. You want to get fired up. That, yeah, that song right yeah. here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, even like John's, uh, John's like, you know, I wouldn't even say they're raps. Yeah, they're chant. almost like like chants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like like talking about like I mean that's the type of song that'll really get Energy. people hurt in the club. You know what, man? Um, so the Falcons have brought me on this year as a brand ambassador, and man, they just let me party and do my thing in there on Sundays, man. I wish the team party a little bit more and damn play better, but the damn crowd we have it off the chain, man. Playing those records to get the crowd in the city crunk up, man. So. It's a beautiful thing, man. I'm glad. I'm talking about these records from 20 years plus, but they still got the same reaction. Okay. So you show up on that record. Yeah. And then right around the same time, you dropped the Universal Soldier album? Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. The yep. Universal Soldier, man, that album was uh, really driven by me being on the Triple X soundtrack with Vin Diesel, man. I had the single for that soundtrack with uh, Are We Cutting, produced by Timberland, featuring my girl, Miss Jade, from Philly. You know, it was cool. It's crazy, man, Vlad. To this day, man, are we cutting? I probably have not performed it more than 20 times. It just really didn't fit in to fit in with my show, the show that I really do. You know what I mean? When I go up to Virginia and stuff like that, DC, I might be able to kick it and get it off, but they respond to it more. But down south and them damn holding the walls and crooking crannies that I hang out. They want to hear that uh, I'm outside, ho, and uh, this the city and all them crazy Pastor Troy songs, man. They ain't really tripping off me doing the joint produced by Timberland. Well, right, because it seems like this album was the first one that you got, like, the big producers on it. It seems yeah. like before then, you were either producing yourself yeah. or you had the, the Atlanta producers, yeah. you know, yeah. doing yeah. their thing. But now you got Timberland. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, and you got cool. Jazzy Faye, yeah. you know, Lil John's producing on this. Yeah, yeah. It was cool, man. You know what I mean? The album, the whole experience, cool. Even down to the photo shoot with Jonathan Mannion, man. Letting us build our relationship that we have and stuff to this day. You know, the majors was cool. I used it for what it was worth. You know what I mean? I had a commitment to them for three or four albums. I did my three or four albums and left out as an independent with respect from them, with them with respect for me. And I just came back and started pursuing my thing as a major independent, taking all the expertise and knowledge that I learned dealing with the majors. Well, that album debuted at number 13. 
<laughs> that's dope. That's dope. That's dope. So you're you're almost top ten at this point. Yeah. You know, on the main Billboard 200, meaning all genres all across the board. Really, man. I'm so talking it's about, and, I'll, yeah, and, I'll, and I'm not even keeping up, and I wasn't even keeping up with it at the time because Universal was still so many light years away from what I really had going on and who I really was down here. They used to come down on for weekends doing press junkets and stuff like that, but. It was some more experience. It was it was something that you need to experience for more than two days to really understand. These people walking around here with tattoos with DSGB and these girls got down south Georgia girl tattoos. It's something going on across this whole state, not just in Atlanta. You know what I mean? So it was cool. It was something for them to figure out as well for me. You know what I mean? Friends know when to say when. And after uh, it was time for me to go after I did my you know obligation of the album. Well, I mean, the next year, 2003, you actually showed up on Young Jeezy's, you know, album before he got signed to Def Jam. Yeah, yeah. On, uh, I think it was called Come Shop With Me. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so how did how did you and Jeezy link, link up? So Coach K was managing Jeezy at the time. Uh, and Coach K was with the dude, Alan Henderson, uh, with Hindu Records. Yeah, he was handling the marketing for them at the time. So... We had always stayed in contact and everything, man. So then he started saying that he was working with Jeezy, bringing him up for making and stuff like that. Wanted to feature. Cool. It was more so a favor for, for Coach. You know what I mean? So it was cool, man. We came up and started working and everything. I didn't know that, damn, he was going to take my ad lib in a couple years. <laughs> but, but it's all good. You know, they say, uh, what they say, uh, is the best form of flattery. <laughs> imitation or copy of his best form of flattery. It's cool. You know, oh, Shorty okay. Red. What's the, ad, what, what's the ad lib? The ad lib. My years, man. My years. You know, Shorty Red, he told me he taught Jeezy how to damn ad lib off of one of my records. I was like, mm. man, why the hell did you teach him that, man? You know what I mean? That secret. He was like, man, I just had to teach him. He just kept messing it up in the studio, man. And I hear it and know it. But the world here might not say anything about it. But on Are We Cutting, I started the record off. I'm like, Friday night. The first thing I say is, yeah, balling home. That's how I started the record. Man, when I started hearing that joint on them records, man, I'm like, oh, my God. They took it and ran with it, man. So when I hollered them about it and everything, it was just always, oh, man, cool. Oh, yeah, man, we're going to work out. We're going to do something. We're going to do something. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was really like he kept, it kept me on ice. Because he knew I would have addressed that shit a long time ago, man. I gave him so much stuff, man. You know what I mean? From the track with uh, Welcome Back, some of my producers and stuff like that, DJ Squeaky out of Memphis. Man, some of the hardest joints that Jesus was having at the time, man. I'm phoning to him because I want him rapping on the beats that I'm rapping on. You know what I mean? It's going to work out for me, but we just never get out of eye and didn't do any more work together. Well, I mean, at the time... Jeezy was running around with BMF. Yeah. And I remember BMF flew me out to uh -huh. Atlanta maybe like two years later. I think uh -huh. maybe around 2005. Yeah. Uh, now, being in Atlanta with BMF doing their thing out there, did you see the effect that BMF had in Atlanta? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those are my boys, man. You know, Meech, all those boys was family, man. All those boys hung out together, you know what I mean, at that time in Atlanta, you know. But I rather been friends from a distance than getting up on there and getting in any kind of situations, man. You know what I mean? It was almost inevitable that something was going to happen. You know what I mean? So it was cool. You know, I respect the movement, but it was really easy to be a movement when you got somebody like that that's backing you with the control and power that he had at the time, man. Come on, man. 100,000 CDs in the street. You better, bu you better blow free. Yeah. You feel me? 100,000 free Mixtapes in the street, you better blow. Yeah, I mean, I actually felt the exact same way because they they were big fans of my rap phenomenon mixtape, uh -huh. like uh, Blue Da Vinci and them. Yeah, and they flew me out, gave me a few dollars, and I was actually hanging out yeah. at Big Meech's house when he yeah. was on house arrest. You know, yeah. after the the shooting when Wolf, Wolf got Wolf, killed. Yeah, yeah, that and, changed uh, Atlanta. Th that changed Atlanta. I remember I was right there yeah. when it was happening, and, and and but just like you said. I'm in with these guys and they're fucking with me and we're smoking and drinking and I'm drinking Cristal for the first time and yeah. everything. But it was just so obvious that all this was going to end so badly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And soon. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, man? You know, I was able to talk to uh, 
talked to Meech, you know, while he'd been on his bid and everything, man. The first thing that he asked, uh, he didn't want no money. He didn't want no anything. He wanted me to put his name in my parents' prayer box, man, that they pray over on Sundays, man, just to get some people, you know, with some good prayers going for him, good energy for him, man. So free Meech, man. Looking forward to watching the BMF story, man. Congratulations to little Meech. All them boys, my family. Yeah, man, free Big Meech. Uh, you know. I got to hang out with him, uh, you know, that one night at his house. Uh, yeah. Very cool, cool dude. Cool crew. Cool. And, uh, but cool. like I said, it, it was just, you know, with the, the billboard, the world is BMF. Too good. It was almost you too know, good to roll, be true. Rolling up with yeah. $2 million worth of cars, dropping 100000 in the club. Yeah. Uh, it was just so much money. And it was obvious that it wasn't coming from record Raps. sales <laughs> yeah <laughs> right it, it was obvious yeah it was obvious yeah. to me yeah like and i'm and i'm just meeting them yeah and so i just i just slowly you know yeah. fucked with them from a distance did so, a few so interviews I'm here and there name. Do, you, do you remember juice juice uh juice she had the juice magazine juice magazine juice, yep. juice. I remember. Yeah, you know she yep. was the female man she was like the mama of the crew rest in peace to juice but with our affiliation me and her were really cool so she kept me in the midst with the boys kept me in the juice magazine and all that stuff man so they really had some good stuff going, man. I just wish they could have got it legit before everything came down like it did. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the, the BMF series as well, man. That's I dope. can't wait to watch it. That's dope. <laughs> okay. Um, so then 2004, you drop By Any Means Necessary. Uh-huh. Man, when and, I dropped- And it had sort of a, like a Malcolm X kind of cover on the front. Yeah. Because that's when I was ready to get the hell on. I was sick of them Universal. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm ready to shoot this damn place up. <laughs> You know what I mean? It was cool. I knew I was about on my way back to doing my independent thing, man. I had started building my relationship up with Selecto Hits in Memphis and stuff like this, man. Southwest Distribution down in Texas. These people promising me $8 per CD wholesale and stuff like that, man. So I was really just fulfilling my commitment at that time with Universal. But hell, I probably dropped. I don't know when I dropped it, but I know probably within six months I was dropping with you know, uh, with uh, Selecto Hits, the joint Face Off. Face, I think I called it Face Off Part 2. That was my first right. project with them, man. Face Off Part 2, we probably did about 78, 78,000 times $8. I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Because that was your final album on Universal, by any yeah. means necessary. Yeah. And it debuted, debuted at number 30. And was that your biggest commercial success at that point? Man, you know what? I wasn't even keeping... I wasn't even paying any attention, man. I was so, I was really building what I'm able to uh, exercise and survive off of right now. It was like I had to take my destiny back into my own hands where the majors, they wanted me to pursue expanding my markets where I turned around and say, I really kill the markets that I'm in. You feel me, man? I wasn't really tripping off of trying to go build up a, a big fan base in California. I wasn't trying to go build up a big fan base in Texas because I'm so strong in Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And Mississippi, I can run, a, man, I've been running around those states for 20 years, picking up the same mm-hmm. money that I'd pick up if I was going to damn get it from Nebraska. So I'd rather ride two hours to Birmingham <laughs> and call it a day. Well, uh, on that album, Face Off Part 2, didn't you address some issues with Lil Scrappy and BME? Yeah, 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 man. You know, I was mad about the whole throw it up situation, man. I was upset with that because I was I knew the I knew the president over there at the label, uh, Steve Gottlieb over at TVT at the time. Steve was telling me about the he was like, Man, I told John that throw it up the single, man. We should have shot the video for this. But they chose to go in another direction. I was like, okay, that one didn't rub me right. Then I saw John, and it was time for the next album after the one that Throw It Up had so much acclaim on. And he just shot it to me like, uh, man, I need your verse when we get back to Atlanta, man. I got to turn my project in. I was like, all right, cool, man. I got you. Just let me know. I can't wait to pull up and knock it down. Cool. I'm going independent now. I need this. This is going to be big for me being on this record with me just leaving the majors like this. So looking forward to that feature, I see Mr. Gottlieb again from TVT. He was like, man, yeah, John just turned in his album uh, two weeks ago and you weren't on it. And I was like, what? I'm like, this motherfucker just told me, you got you need to see me this week to finish it. So that's why all that uh, 
confusion and uh confusion came from and the energy came from on that record. You know, it's cool, man. I'm glad that I'm able to release my frustration in the booth without having to really go out in the street and fuck nobody up. You know what I mean, man? So it's cool. All us boys, you know, that's years behind. But shit, I got to let everybody know where the shit came from. Well, that same year you showed up on a Chameleonaires album. Yeah. Uh, Sound Revenge on yeah. Southern Takeover with Killer Mike. Yeah, yeah. Chameleon, I need my plaque. Because I know you went platinum on that joint, man. I need that old plaque, brother. I'm probably Chameleon, oh, yeah. man. You know what I mean? He's always been a businessman, man. Even from that feature, him working that joint out. You know what I mean, man? Troy, I want you on this joint, man. I probably charged Chameleon there $10,000 back then. He kicked it up. I don't even know if he was... He was probably just getting on with Universal, but he had an independent... Uh, already had an independent game going for himself, too, out of Houston and everything, man. So it was good business, man. I like those boys out there, how they do it. Him, Paul Wall, uh, Slim Thug, everybody getting down in Texas, man. All those boys were kind of hustling the same way. Well... At that point, it seemed like you just started dropping album after album yeah. after album yeah. after album. I mean, two albums in 2006, an album yeah. in 2007, yeah. man, you three know what, albums man, in 2008. Just the freedom to be able to do it, man. I start, I had to change my focus. It wasn't like you were depending on that budget for this album delivery to the majors again. You know what I mean? Like, okay, so with a major, if you don't know, you know, out there, they might say, okay, here you go, uh, $300,000 budget to produce your album. So you got to put your album together and have your little advance out of this $300,000 to put this together. With me being independent now, I don't have the luxury of this $300,000, but I do have the luxury of $50,000 sales times $8. So I'll turn around and do that three times to make up for the three hundred. dollars You know what I mean, man? Dog, we can drop in those joints. Every six months, drop. Every six months, drop. Then some of my guys started coming in from California buying albums from me all in. Like, Troy, all right, man, you can come out here to Sacramento from Monday to Thursday. I pay you $75,000 and we keep all the proceeds of the album. I don't give a damn. Let's do it. You know what I mean, man? Couple of licks like that. Independent, man, I love it. You know what I mean? You just got to know how to play the game to keep this thing rolling like it's supposed to roll. I love it. I love it. Uh, I love sure. it. <laughs> well, uh, in 2017, you battled Bone Crusher? Yeah, 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 man. You know, it wasn't much of a battle. That's my partner. That's my friend. You know, I think this was before Versus and all this good stuff. You know what I mean? Right. But people just trying to get stuff going, but that 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 wasn't that wasn't good. <laughs> Right. I mean, I watched it. It didn't really look like a real battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't much of a battle, man. Bones, my friend. We've been partners for years. It was more so an opportunity for whoever was trying to put it together. There you go. There yeah. you go. Well, um, I remember T.I. had posted a picture. Yeah. It, on his Instagram. It was him, Jeezy, and Ludacris. Yeah. And he said, be clear, these faces, along with a host of others that look like us, laid the foundation of the infrastructure, artistic ecosystem, you now known as Atlanta. But this is our shit. We run the city, don't get it fucked up. We'll adjust the temperature to make it as hot or cold as we see fit. If we ain't with it, it ain't shit. <laughs> and you actually responded to this post. I had to. Okay. I had to. Because if I would have been at that show, Everybody would have knew who the who daddy was. <laughs> you feel me, man? <laughs> you know, it's cool, bro. It's almost like they started playing the keep past Troy out game. You know what I mean? All right, dog, we just gonna block it. We just gonna block it. They looked at not being with a major and being independent as down. But it's not down. It's just you in control of your own destiny. Here we are looking at it now. Everybody wants to be independent. You feel me, man? Everybody. Everybody. Oh man. So being a uh, being who I was in this game, come on, man. What the hell can those guys really say about me? They don't want to talk about me and my impact or what I really did because all of them know. I got stories from all of them from opening up and shit for me. You ain't got no stories about me opening it up for you. I didn't learn nothing from y'all. You learned a lot from me. And you just got to respect that. You know what I mean? man? I never let nobody talk over me like I didn't do what I did down here in this city because everybody knows I ain't got this belt around my shoulder for nothing. Hold it up high. And I always will till it's over. Well, yeah, because you showed up on all three of their debut albums. Yeah. T.I., Jeezy, 
and Ludacris. You showed up on their debut not, albums. I did not call anybody to get on their album. You understand me? They called me. Yeah. You tell me why. <laughs> you tell me why you needed me on there. You know, but Vlad, look, just even looking at it, even the years between those albums, I'm still popping. You feel me, man? What? What was Luda? That was what, 99, 2000? When was Jeezy? Yeah. Probably 05? Yeah. This five, that's five more years, and you still need me on them damn album. So, it's understood. Well, I mean, you've dropped so many albums over the years. Have you tried to reach out to those three for features and so forth? Um, not really, man. You know what I mean? After all this time, it really is what it is. You know what I mean? Everybody's doing their thing, and it's cool. You know what I mean? But I still ain't gonna let nobody post and goddamn act like I ain't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> right. Petty <laughs> Betty. Well, uh, in 2020, uh, Lil Nas X yeah. uh, showed up to the Grammys yeah. in, a, in a hot pink cowboy outfit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you chimed in on this. Yeah. You said, well, I guess I won't be winning a Grammy if this is how I gotta, what I got to wear. Yeah. We love to push this shit on our kids. The other day at Applebee's, had some punks kissing and laughing, eating mozzarella sticks. <laughs> <laughs> First thing my 14-year-old son said was, fuck Applebee's. Yeah. It brought joy to my heart. Yeah. He sees that their agenda to take the masculinity from men, black men especially. Some may say he making money. RuPaul did too, but I ain't bumping his CD. Integrity's <laughs> priceless. Y'all better open that third eye and let your sons know what is real or the yeah. ass gonna be headed down that old town road for real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I said, Okay, the, the, the Applebee's part is, is what made me kind of laugh. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Applebee's, the... the the, the mozzarella sticks and yeah. Applebee's. I, I wasn't ready for that part yeah, of the Yeah, man. I wasn't ready well, either. I wasn't ready either. You okay, know what? So, Go ahead. Well, I mean, Lil Nas at that point had come out as gay, right? Yeah. He came out of the closet. Old Town Road was a giant song, and he came out as gay, and he mm -hmm. embraced that. And to this day, he's still embracing it. Yeah. Uh, what about that moment, seeing him dressed up in the pink cowboy suit, rubbed you the wrong way? Man, you know what? All the attention and emphasis on it, man. It just, I just felt like they just lured the kids in and then smack them over the head with this, I'm gay. Come on, man. It's almost like they making us have to have these discussions with our kids that we may not necessarily, as parents, be ready to have this yet. You feel me, man? Come on, man. I'm sitting here watching TV, man, my kid. Seeing these commercials, this is a seven-year-old. Seeing the commercials of two d dudes kissing like it ain't nothing, man. My son like, Daddy, that ain't right. That ain't right. And here I am at he's seven. I gotta say, well, son, some people feel differently. And da -da 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 -da. really, man, I really gotta do this shit at seven now. It's just difficult, man. You know what I mean? And it, me, I was raised with a father. You know what I mean? I was raised with a father. He he disciplined me and raised me to be a man. I remember at three or four years old, putting on my mom high heel shoes and my pops popping me. Pop! I don't know no better. I'm just putting on the damn shoes. But he corrected me. I'm a child. Hey, no, that ain't what men do. All right, Dad, that ain't what men do. And I learned it. I, I love being a man. I love the way that my father raised me. And I would be less than a father not to give my son the same opportunity. Now, at 18 years old, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do, that's on you. But while you're under these rules and eating off these plates that I'm providing for these 18 years, we're going to do this shit like I say. And that's all I was saying to the masters. Well, how many kids do you have right now? Man, I got three boys, man. That's the shit. You know what I mean? They're okay. The thing. You, got, you got three boys. Yeah. If one of your kids came to you and said, Dad, listen. Uh, I know I'm I'm 16 or I'm underage, but you know uh, I've done a lot of self introspection and and I'm gay and I want you as my father, who I love, to accept that about myself. And I know you love me. Mm -hmm. how, how how do you react to that? That'll be um you know that'll be a situation I have to address if it came. But from the little girls and the likes I see my little boys doing, I doubt it very seriously, man. <laughs> I doubt it very seriously. And you know what I mean. I'm not tripping on no parent or anybody else who has to deal with any other situations with their kids. I know gay kids and all this stuff, man. I'm just talking about my situation, man. You know what I mean? I wish everybody out there the best. 
But like, I can't teach you how to raise your kids. Can't nobody teach me how to raise mine. Well, uh, Lil Nas X actually responded <laughs> in his own way. Hey, and, I gave it all to Boosie. And, <laughs> well, right. Well, he he basically put up a meme and it said, Pastor Troy, when he see two dudes eating mozzarella sticks. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think Ayana Van Zandt was like, not on my watch. <laughs> you know, it's cool, man. He got a whole team over there, man. I got to get a team like he has, man. They really got them protected very well. It's cool, man. You know what I mean? Laughing at Bootsy, man. I just sit back and watch Bootsy, man, and watch the baby and just say, y'all, just let it roll, man. Just I'll live to fight another day, man. Let it, let it ride. Let them have it. Well, I mean, you never really apologized or backed down or, yeah. or explained yeah. yourself because, you know, you said, you know, when people were questioning you about this, you said that you weren't being homophobic, but you also said being gay isn't right, yeah. which is... A fairly homophobic statement. Yeah, you fair. know what I mean, dog. And I'm not gonna say that it's not being not being right. I'm not gonna say that it's not being that being gay is not right. It's just not for, right for me and my family. You know what I mean? You know okay. what I mean? It might be right for you. It might be. I know. I know. Well, one of the reporters that was interviewing me, man, she had two mothers. You know, uh, whatever, however the situation may go and everything, man. But we still I had a great interview, great common ground. I'm a pastor son, man. At church, we've met. Everybody, you know what I mean? And I'm cool and I'm able to exist. Come on, man, I'm living in Atlanta, Georgia. This shit is baby San Francisco right now. You know what I mean? But it's cool and I, I survive. I meet everybody. I show everybody love. I show everybody respect. Everybody shows me and shows me respect. And that's just how we live. I mean, when you saw the baby, you know, after he made those comments on stage mm -hmm. and people literally start canceling big shows, like yeah. big, yeah. you know, yeah. festivals that he was booked on and so forth started getting canceled one yeah. after another. Yeah. Not to say that he was completely canceled, but yeah. he did lose some money along the way. He, he issued he issued uh, an apology and he met with like nine different HIV organizations and he's still having to kind of jump through hoops, I Hoop. feel, to a certain degree. Yeah. When, when you saw that happen, how did you feel? You know, it was unfortunate, but here was another one of those sections of it was inevitable because when you're in that system, you got to play by the rules and respect it. You know what I mean, man? You already know who the powers that be in, in those situations. You know what I mean? You already know who controls that deck of cards. And just to be out there, man, in that position, man, I'm independent. I don't have any pe the people who, who follow me and support me are basically like-minded people. You know what I mean? I don't have to depend on all the sponsorship and stuff like that, that a major artist on his level has to depend on. You know what I mean? So you gotta be a lot more careful, man. I wish he could have just rewind all of that, man, and took it back and just let it ride. You know what I mean? A lot of things, you know, the things he said, man, it's like back when they used to say, ugly people be quiet. And the whole club say, like, ah, you know what I mean? He was trying to get some shot value, but it just didn't go over smooth. You know what I mean? It just didn't go over smooth. And I'm sure that he does have gay fans and people that he know and all that stuff, man, that didn't really take it the way that some of the people that probably weren't nowhere in the building took it. You know what I mean? So hopefully that he learns from that situation, man, and uh, just be a lot smarter, man. You know what I mean? Sometimes it's best to keep some of your thoughts to yourself, you know what I mean, man? You got a beautiful family. You can talk about everything you want to talk to, talk about at your dinner table and stuff like that, man. But every ta every conversation that we have at Detroit dinner, dinner table is not for the world. Right, because you being independent and doing certain types of shows, it doesn't seem like you really got affected. It's not like after yeah. you made the little Nas X comment, yeah. a bunch of your shows got canceled, oh, right? Oh, no, nah, man. It's basically My... business as usual, right? Yeah, man, business as usual, but... I would have even handled it differently had I been still in a universal system, Interscope system, when I know I'm depending on so many other things to make this whole thing move. And of course, you know, Boosie has made his comments, you know, and he's a regular on my show. So a lot of those comments Boosie. were made on Vlad TV. <laughs> hey, I can sit back and chill, man, and just let my boy Boosie Boo handle his business, man. <laughs> I love to see him come through Vlad, man. I know he's going to give me something for the day. <laughs>
Oh yeah. No, I mean, and Boosie, I feel has somewhat of a similar view as you. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's got sons and daughters. Yeah. And uh, you know, he doesn't feel what Lil Nas X is, is putting out there is is cool yeah. in terms of how he raises his kids, and, yeah. and that that's his choice. Um, I just hate it. Know, I just it, hate it. I just hate it. So it's so you got to accept it. But if you don't accept it, it's like you want me to respect you for who you are, but you don't want to respect me for who I'm not. You feel me? Like, it's cool. I respect you for that, but respect me for not being that. And we can coexist, man, and we can live. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to... If nobody's right, nobody's wrong. If nobody's wrong, ain't nobody right. Well, I mean, but I think the problem comes down to when you're the majority no one's really going to really feel sorry for you in terms of your point of views or or so forth you know you yeah. being a heterosexual man you're in the majority being yeah. a gay man or a gay woman you're in the minority and you can't discount the fact that th these group of people have been discriminated you know, all discriminated that. against yeah. really for all time yeah. you know what i mean yeah. not even recently it's an all time thing and they are a minority yeah. you know what i'm saying like like you're all a, that, you're man. a minority you know, I'm in black. certain ways, but yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. I, know, I know all about it. You know what I mean? Exactly. I know all about it. That's what I'm saying. So it's, you know? it's like, you know, I, I can't I can't sit there, you know, as a white man in America say, let me tell you how hard it is. I want you to respect my, my stance for me being white or whatever else. It's like, yeah. all right. Like, you know, I understand as a majority, you don't, you can't say certain things. And as a minority, you have to have you have to treat things a little bit differently. So you can't just say, well, you got to respect me if I respect you, but this is a group of people that have been disrespected and have been prosecuted and so forth. Me personally, I'm straight, you know what I'm saying? Yep. So, so, you know, but I, you know, if you want to be gay, th then you're gay. Like yep. it is what it is. Lil Nas X is living his truth. And he's obviously, it seems like he did better when he came out as gay. Yep. You know, yep. Old Town Road may have been a one hit wonder if he was just that straight black kid. Yeah. You know what I mean? But the fact that he came out as gay and he's You know, like it took really... on a whole nother phenomenon. It took on a whole nother life. It, it cracked up a whole yeah. nother fan base. I'm looking for yeah. me a gay artist. See if I can blow <laughs> me one up right out here. <laughs> there you go. For sure. There you go. That would be perfect. Yeah. Pastor Troy signs a gay artist. <laughs> there you go. It would That's all be up. full circle. Lil yeah, Nas X would be a feature on it. With a feature by Boosty. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's what's up. <laughs> there you go, man. There you go. Well, Pastor Troy, man, definitely an honor to finally sit down. Man, all oh, mine. Because, you know, because like these songs that you have have become bigger than just the song itself. It's become yeah. anthems for the city. Like, yeah. you know, you posted videos of you at like, you know, at football games yeah. where you're on camera and you're yeah. doing these songs and the whole crowd yeah. is, is cheering. Yeah. And, and even, uh, didn't Beyonce uh, yeah. do yeah. one of your songs at Coachella? Yeah, man, it's a beautiful thing, man. You know what I mean? Being independent, man, I often just have to just tell myself, man, hey, man, damn what anybody say, man, you did a great job with making it last so long, man. We booked, I'm still touring Booked every week here, man. Like I said, gigs with the Falcons. I'm on the radio. I'm doing all kinds of stuff, man. And I love it. We got movies, man, doing numbers. You know what I mean? So it's just great. I just love trying, man. I just love trying every day. Waking up, getting a chance to just do something. It's great. I love it. Well, it goes to show what your work ethic is. Yeah. Because I feel that 90% of artists that were on major labels once they either leave or get dropped or whatever, they're dead. They don't. They don't end up doing shit. Yeah, yeah. because they're so used to that support and yeah. so used to having everyone else do that, such a big part of their job that when it's time for them to do everything, can't do nothing. Can't do nothing. Yeah, right. I'm so glad that I didn't get spoiled like that, man. You know what I mean? That I always had to keep on pushing for the Pastor Troy thing to hit. Like I said, man, you telling me numbers about where I came in and on Billboard and stuff like that, man, I was probably somewhere putting up damn posters. <laughs> you know what I mean? Making that thing stick. So I appreciate all your research, man. You got a good uh, platform here, man. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing your story, man. Like I said, legendary Atlanta artist uh, who released at the Blueprint for a lot of people that came afterwards who created songs that are going to live on past our lifetimes. Yeah. You know, man, I, I can imagine in, you know, 2090, 
you know, they'll still be playing these songs at Atlanta Hawks games. That's dope, so man. Forth. That's dope, man. Dog, you know, the bands and everything, man, it's real dope just to yep. hear this joint, man. Somebody sent me a sixth grade band playing vice versa. Come on, mm. man. That song's over to, 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 twice their age. You know what I mean? Yep. So, man, uh, Vlad, I have a channel, man, that I crunk up, man, Lit Street TV. It's on the Roku TV. It's on Amazon Fire Stick, man. All we do is show independent videos and stuff like that and mix it in with the majors. Man, come on. How does it feel for a little baby video to go off and go to them, your homeboy? You know what I mean? So we got mm -hmm. the app out there, Lit Street TV. Download the app, man. Check it out. Get it rolling. I also got DSGB Radio, dsgbradio.com. We just focus on playing independent artist music, man, interviewing, giving them a game about this stuff, man. I hope that this whole uh, interview right here helps uh, independent artists out there, man, just to know what it really takes in this game, man. And that's the kind of stuff that I try to give you all these jewels of how determined you have to be, how you have to take it. You got to take control back of your situation, man. Don't ever get in a situation, man, where everybody's doing everything for you. Because when they put you down, you're going to fall hard. Right. And as someone who's dropped, I mean, how many albums? Do you Man, have? I stopped like counting, Vlad. I stopped counting, Vlad. I stopped counting. I just yeah. go, baby. I just go. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like 30 or 40 albums. Man, I, man, I appreciate it, man. You know what I mean? Just to have content, man, stories like that, man, it's just a release to be able to just go in the booth and just let your frustrations out, man, on wax. It's a beautiful thing, man. I thank God for it. There you go. Pastor Troy, man, truly an honor to sit down and uh, wish you only the best in the future. All right. See you soon, brother. Peace. Peace.